is a tribute to one of our best loved and respected scholars whose work is known to all, Ashish Nandi. So I'm your host and chair today. I'm Ravi Sundaram. And we have a fantastic panel who I'll now introduce. The first is Shell Mayaram, uh, my colleague and the editor of the book in discussion. So Shell is currently an honorary fellow at the CSDS. Shell was until recently a, prof a professor at the CSDS. So Shell's many publications include Against History, Against State, Counter Perspectives from the Margins, Resisting Regimes, Myth, Memory, and the Shaping of a Muslim Identity, and Israel as a Gift of the Arabs, Letters from Tel Aviv. She co-authored with Ashish Nandi, Creating a Nationality, the Ram Janma movie movement and the fear of self. So Shell has worked on subordinate pasts and moral imaginations of a peasant, pastoral and forest communities, cosmopolitanism in the city, and Shell is interested in Indian and Islamic knowledge traditions. Very soon, her next book, A Secret Life of Another Indian Nationalism, transitions from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana, is coming very soon from Cambridge University Press. The next speaker, is Shankar Ramaswamy. So Shankar works on the anthropologies of globalization, migration, urban workers, and religion in South Asia. So Shankar completed an AB in economics in Harvard College and an MA and a PhD in sociocultural anthropology at the University of Chicago. He was a lecturer in South Asian studies at the Department of South Asian Studies uh, at Harvard University, where he taught course, courses in anthropology, literature, cinema, and religion. Shankar is currently completing a book entitled Souls in the Kalyug, The Politics and Cosmologies of Migrant Workers in Delhi at OP Jindal University. Our final speaker, who uh, doesn't need an introduction, but I'm definitely going to do it. Uh, Tipesh Chakravarti is currently the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished uh, Service Professor in History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. Dipesh is a founding member of the Editorial Collective of Subordinate Studies. He's a consulting editor of Critical Inquiry, a founding editor of Postcolonial Studies. So Dipesh's most recent book is Climate of History in a Planetary Age. Other books include The Crisis of Civilization, Exploring Global and Planetary Histories. Uh, his extremely well-known book, which we read when we were students, is uh, Rethinking Working Class History, Bengal, 1890-1940, Provincializing Europe, Postcolonial Thought and Historical Dif Difference. And of course, there's Habitations of Modernity, Essays in the Wake of uh, uh, sub Subordinate Studies, Calling of History, Jadunath Sarkar and His Empire of Truth. Provincializing Europe has been translated into Italian, French, Polish, Spanish, Turkish, and Korean, and I think it's being brought up in Chinese. So uh, Dipesh has been an old visitor to CSDS, and once again, we welcome him today. Now, typically, in webinars of this kind, the chair, that is me, begins with some framing remarks. I think this event is a celebration of a tribute to one of the most significant intellectuals of post-independence India, notably Ashish Nadi. So I won't go on for a long time. I can only say that my colleague Shail Mayaram, in putting together this book, faced no easy task. And why is that? Ashish has commented on every significant intellectual and political figure in India's history. You have Bonkin, Ram Mohan Roy, Ramakrishna, Vivekanand, Tagore, Gandhi, Savarkar, to name a few. We have his engagement with the interpretation of the Mahabharata, the Ramayana. We have commentaries on Ramanujam and Bose. There are international figures like Tolstoy, Freud, Adorno, Dostoevsky, Orwell, Fanon. There are engagements on with cricket, cinema, writers like you are Anantamurti, the late D.R. Nagaraj. And Nandi has stimulated debates on colonialism, nationalism, civilization, secularism, political psychology, violence, nonviolence, masculinity, the Western political project, the genesis of modern genocide. And this list is just my list. You really have a strong theoretical catalog of the contemporary. Uh, and to take on Ashish's work is to really engage with the intellectual map of our time. It takes, I think, audacity uh, and appreciation of Ashish Nandi's distinct deployment of the tragic, the fantastic, and the humorous in his style. I think what is commendable in this volume uh, Shail has put together is not only has she expertly 
managed to distill many of these questions, but also produced a very interesting dialogue from her side, a critical dialogue with Ashish Nandi's work. So without any delay, we move on to the first speaker, Shail Myra. So uh, thank, thank you, uh, Ravi. Um, I've been a bit distracted because there are all these messages coming in of friends who are not able to log in. So I've just been forwarding them the, the, the links. Uh, so uh, welcome to a global party. Uh, this party, as Ravi's mentioned, is to celebrate one of our most important thinkers, Ashish Tanti. It is also about celebrating CSDS and the fellowship it incubated. Ashish Nandi's thought was shaped in argumentative dialogue with his colleagues, prominently Rajni Kothari and DL Shet. And I do hope Dhirubhai has also been able, able to log in. This volume is the outcome of CSDS 50 years, uh, 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 CSDS at 50. Uh, which was a year long celebration of a very distinctive institution of the Global South and was steered by Rajiv Bhargav, who's then director, and Ravi Sundaram. The three of us were part of the organizing committee. This book focuses largely on Ashish Da's contribution as a theorist. Although it also touches upon his roles as political commentator and most important, storyteller. In fact, it is often through stories really that, uh, that he makes an entry uh, into a larger theoretical point. And uh, many of the stories uh, you know, that, uh, that I, I, I sort of also tell, retell in the book uh, have been garnered from CSDS's extended lunches that are legendary. Ashish Da is also a juggler of statistics, one might add, and could have figured in one of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's magical realist novels. Being in academic volume, the committee had to perforce uh, limit the number of contributions to nine, 10 essays to the great disappointment of many who would have liked to uh, contribute to this volume. Uh, I have uh, two contributions uh, in, the, in, in the book, and I'll, and I'll speak briefly about them. In the introduction, uh, I describe Ashishta as a flaneur of modernity. Flaneur was Walter Benjamin's term for his own exploration of the city of Paris. He learns even as he gets lost in the lanes and by lanes of the city. Many describe Ashishta as a public intellectual, but the best description is really his own self-deprecating reference to himself as the local shrink at CSDS. And indeed, this is what he does. Puts Madan Lal Pawa, Vinayak Damodar Savorkar, and Rudyard Kipling on the couch. The cover of the book, has a painting by Redapa Naidu in which Vishnu in his form as Narasimha tears open the entrails of the demon, a metaphor for what Ashista does for modernity. His complex, uh, and modernity being a complex of state, history, scientific rationality and development that is constitutive of violence. My core argument is that along with his critique of modernity, he also perceives flashes of re-enchantment. Hence the importance of Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Desmond Tutu, Partho Chatterjee's essay on to go, in fact, bring, brings this out. But I also have a critique of Ashish Landi. The first being, that possibly the tools of the cultural psychologist are inadequate to comprehending the extraordinary moves uh, 
that mohan gandhi uh, uh, mohan Moh, mohandas karamchand gandhi makes as also aurobindo ghosh and i'm saying this in the context that ashistas core insight which is outlined most forcefully in intimate en enemy is the contribution of anti colonial thought and that mohandas gandhi and aurobindo ghosh represent for him the decolonization of knowledge now there's been recently a whole lot of work on gandhi and some work also on aurobindo ghosh and i'll just make a reference briefly to peter he's brilliant work on aurobindo bindo ghosh peter uh, incidentally also set up the aurobindo archive and i'd like to raise the question of how peter's work points out how the left has virtually ensured that aurobindo ghosh was handed over to hindutva on a platter and i'll leave it at that my second crit critique of ashishta is his argument with respect to history and in a sense in 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 my essay uh, on 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 the on the subject i bring ranajit guha and ashish nandi in dialogue in inter interlocutory dialogue so on on the one hand there's the position of alternative history and uh, dipesh has also written uh, and commented on that and 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 shahid amin uh, as well and you know the idea of ash ash ashish that's the idea of alternative to history and i present the argument that for marginalized groups who might be peasant and pastoralists and i discuss three case studies uh, one of the community of meos on on whom my larger work has been another community of uh, called the merat and a third community of the gujjar bakarwals the ways in which history for them becomes a mode to express the pain of marginality and violence but thanks ashishta for a wonderful journey thank you uh, thank you uh, shell uh, now uh, what we'll do is uh, go to shankar Shankar, uh, it's all, the floor is yours, or the screen is yours. Uh, please make your presentation. Okay, thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Shail. Uh, uh, thank you, Dipeshla. Um, some time ago, at the India International Center, uh, there was a book release for someone else's book, and Ashish Nandi was uh, one of the speakers. So he got up and he said. with a smile well i have not read the book so therefore i can speak very confidently about it well uh, i think i know what he means now because i've gone through some of this book and um you know one can't just hold forth as one would like but uh, so what i'm going to try to do is uh, I, i would just like to make some comments about uh, uh dr nandi and uh, some reference to the book i would like to contribute as it were to this tribute uh, and also critical engagement with the thought of uh, ashish nandi dr nandi i've always called him that uh, and why because i think no matter what how one describes ashish nandi political psychologist sociologist cultural critic public intellectual street fighter uh, ultimately i think he is a healer Uh, a healer of societies uh he he has said to me in the past when i tried to discuss uh, uh some of let's say my own work uh he will say you must look for the signs of life within the patient and attempt to build on them you cannot just let the patient die now uh what are these signs of life in this ailing society that is modern india i think for uh, dr nandi one might say 
it is the coexistence of contrary potentialities, sometimes what he calls double or multiple ledgers in the self and the social world of exclusivism and inclusivism. Um, I think how he has made, how he has formulated this uh, quite starkly uh, is the contestation of Gandhi and Savarkar within every Indian. Now, I just want to make a claim here without necessarily uh, 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 enough evidence, but uh, Ashish Nandi, I believe, has not changed his mind in the last 40 years, uh, uh, except maybe once. I know he has said, for example, that um, he thought before that caste identities and affiliations might thwart, uh, uh, constrain the abilities to mobilize along lines of religious community. And I believe he has changed his mind on that. But uh, I'm remembering a 1980, 1980 essay on, uh, uh, from At the Edge of Psychology called Final Encounter, which is about the encounter between Gorse and Gandhi. Um, and he has been developing this idea, I think, ever since then. Uh, 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 it's not to say that uh, he has not observed massive changes in the world, uh, but that he has a capacious enough frame, it seems, built on possibilities, tendencies, forces, and processes in conflict so that he can see changes in societies within those frames. So uh, that contest, that struggle in modern India and in ordinary Indians, he, he, can, he, he feels it's anticipated in Tagore's Gora in 1910. Uh, culminates in the assassination of Gandhi, but uh, this struggle is arguably uh, very much alive in the present. So that Savark herself, uh, Shale has in a way already alluded to it, the apotheosis of instrumental rationality, of hyper-masculinity, of a strong nation state, an anthropocentric urban industrial anti-ecological vision of progress and development, exclusivist forms of religious identity, social engineering programs seeking uniformity and homogeneity, not diversity and dissent. And the Gandhi self being the inclinations and tendencies uh, and desires towards alternative decentralized ecological forms of development, ideals of femininity and androgyny over hypermasculinity, uh, understandings of religions with inclusive and fuzzy boundaries. And I think there's something more to it too. It also involves the categories among the demos, among ordinary people, by which they understand oppression and injustice and the kinds of practices they engage in to stand up to that oppression and injustice. So uh, in a very interesting essay that Nandi wrote called Gandhi After Gandhi, which has just come out, uh, again, in uh, a book called Breakfast with Evil. I th he mentions the, the third Gandhi, which is sort of the activists like Vandana Shiva, Medha Patkar, uh, intellectuals like Rajini Kotari, uh, who, uh, you know, might, uh, intellectuals who might read, discuss, and debate Gandhi by day, but by evening, you know, they must have their scotch. And here, not Desi, but must be foreign. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 what a friend of mine had called you know, Scotch Gandhians. Uh, that's the third Gandhi, but also the fourth Gandhi. These are people who don't necessarily know anything, know, know very little about Gandhi, but uh, for whom Gandhi becomes a symbol uh, of struggles against perceived injustices, against tyrants in the world, uh, while also, and I think this is very important, while also trying not to distort oneself in the process of uh, fighting and resisting, and struggling against uh, injustice. So um, uh, Shale has just talked about the cover image of the book. I actually think it's very appropriate. Uh, and if I may just uh, reflect on this cover image for a moment. Um, okay. Uh, Ravi, can we, uh, is this uh, visible now? Yes. Right. 
uh, so, uh, you know, I actually think this painting is probably another rendering of this Savarkar Gandhi model of the self and of contestations within society. This, not this, not the final encounter, but this ongoing encounter that Dr. Nundi is talking about. Although here you get an interesting inversion because uh, the father figure here, Hiran uh, and the son, Brahla, it's a little different because Godse looked at, to Gandhi as the father to be killed. But uh, you have Hiranya Kashyap, an, uh, 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 an arrogant, hubristic Asura king who rules all the worlds. You have Prahlad, his son, who becomes devoted to Vishnu as the supreme omnipresent being. And his father cannot take this. And in his fury, attempts to kill Prahlad by all kinds of means. And this leads eventually to the avatar of Narasimha. Uh, avatar of Vishnu as the man lion, he must take this form because of the kind of protective boon that Hiranya Kashyap has earned from Brahma, which governs the conditions under which he can be killed. And uh, Narisama pulls uh, Hiranya Kashyap over his knees, rips him open, and destroys him. Now, uh, I might suggest here that uh, our that that the that the Hiranya Kashyap here, and I think uh, I think. Um, Shale is alluding to this. It is the arrogance of the civilizing mission. It is the arrogance of the post-imperial modernizing mission and its condescension towards non-modern knowledge systems, ways of life, communities, religious beliefs and practices and traditions of non-violence and the desire to do away with them. So I think Shale is right. Nandi's work takes on these demonic forces of modernity. And also I might add the elites who have become, to use an uh, expression of Dostoevsky, possessed uh, by these demons, by these forces and ideas on the right and the left. So not just the Savarkarites, but also the adherents of liberalism and Marxism, uh, who share some of these values, ideals, and gaze on the non-modern. These are mostly actually one of these friends in the world, I should add. Now, uh, I do think Dr. Nambi has taken on these kinds of forces in modern India for a particular purpose, which is to try to give respect and perhaps also to enlarge the spaces to live and breathe for the Prahalad-like humble dissenting traditions and belief systems, the non-violent agitations and movements witnessed in the country. That means ecological movements, uh, Dalit Adivasi farmers movements, practices of existence, of sorry, of coexistence and of living together of ordinary believing Hindus and Muslims, including recently, for example, the Scheinbach protests and the current farmers protests on the Delhi border and refusing to see them as infants. In fact, uh, asking how to listen and learn from them even today in the face of Hindutva. Uh, 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 and he has, a, I think he has tremendous belief says Hinduism has survived for 3,000 years, it will survive this too. So the otherness that confronts the violences and injustices of modern civilization, I think that has been uh, what he has been trying to do. Um, I would just add uh, just very briefly that this Prahlad figure this pra and the story that is on the cover is, was very important to Gandhi. You know, Prahlad was seen as the exemplary Satyagrahi and uh, uh, he, he, Prahlad was worked into one of the ashram vows, the vow of truth, uh, symbolized by Prahlad, and the idea that one must say no, stand up to things uh, without worrying about the consequences. And even when uh, when Vinoba Bhave asked Gandhi to, it told Gandhi that he wanted him to see himself as a father figure to Vinoba, uh, Gandhi said, yes, okay, I shall strive to be worthy of it. And if ever I become another Hiranya Kashyapu, Oppose me respectfully as Prahlad, who loved God, disobeyed him. So it's like Gandhi also could see the proclivities within people to become authoritarian, to become hubristic, and also to be non-hierarchical, to be non-egoistic. And um, it's my uh, submission that in this battle, if you like, uh, with the demonic forces of modernity, yes, Ashish Nandi's tone has been polemical, scathing, and ferocious, especially when taking on the Badrlok, his own people. But what is admirable is that in this battle, he has not become a Hiranyakashyap himself. 
And maybe this is something to do with Nandi's own double ledgers, the way he writes critically when taking on power, because in person, uh, he's a most calm, gentle, warm, kind, and generous person. Uh, more like, uh, well, one second. Nandi the bull, stable, settled, difficult to provoke, no matter how viciously he is critiqued and attacked, including in this book. Not so much the ferocious Narasimha. So uh, uh, this I also see as an achievement. Now, um, let me just wrap up briefly. I, I, I would like to just uh, you know, turn to the book because I do think that this painting on the cover gives a frame for also the essays in the book. This is not Ashish Nandi's you know, heroic activity. Uh, all, the, all the pieces in the book, I think, are contributing in some way, either to take on the distortions and violences of modernity or to excavate alternatives, uh, alternative imaginaries and ways of being, uh, uh, the Prahalad-like uh, traditions and possibilities in the world. And perhaps all are contributing, like Ashishta, to a kind of collective Narasimha avatar in the present, if you like. And along the way, they are also providing critiques. Shale's piece, for one, uh, Rajiv Bhargava's piece, uh, Partha Chatterjee disagrees with Ashwandi's uh, reading of Tagore. I, if I had time, I would go into a little bit more in detail, uh, but I do think Rajiv Bhargava's piece is very interesting. Uh, and he is, especially in what he is proposing, I don't think he would be satisfied with simply the model of Gandhi and Savarkar in the cell. I think he feels, uh, and the kinds of struggles that uh, that all of that implies in the self and in the social world, he makes a case there for a certain idea of the uh, secular tolerant state, which must also uh, work to protect uh, these threatened kinds of traditions while also working to reform uh, the non-modern and these other kinds of traditions in line with certain perhaps constitutional values. So that's a very, uh, uh, that's a very interesting argument and it raises many questions uh, of how is this dialogue supposed to occur between the modern and non-modern and can it really occur in such a way that is not destructive to the latter? Okay, well, I think my, uh, my time is up. So I will just say with gratitude uh, to Shale, uh, 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 express gratitude to Shale uh, and the other contributors for giving us this volume um, and to the other people who have, uh, con who have contributed to the discussions uh, and, and that have gone into preparing this volume. Ravi, Aditya Nigam, other people who have not directly contributed, but have contributed otherwise. And to Dr. Nandi, healer of our times, for your writings, your speaking, your inspiration, your instruction, and your example. Thank you, uh, Shankar. That was really nice. Uh, you know, you, you really covered a range of range of things. And, uh, it, it, you know, I really liked your touching of the political uncanny to the philosophical, to the to the humorous. I mean, you brought in, you really brought Ashish's humor. It's lovely. So I now invite uh, Deepesh Dha to make his presentation. Um, Thank you. I'll just give myself 15 minutes on, on my timer so that I don't uh, exceed my time. Uh, but I have to begin by thanking Shail and Ravi for, for their invitation, for inviting me to join this uh, panel. It's a great opportunity and, and a great honor, actually, to be speaking about Ashista, um, who, as you all said, is one of the most important intellectual of our times, not just for India or in India, but actually globally, I think he's one of the most important thinkers um, that we have to reckon with. Um, Shankar has also made my job a lot easier by uh, uh, talking about the book uh, and, and what it contains. Shail gave some ideas about the book, uh, but also by speaking of Ashish Nandi as, as the healer of 
of uh, our times and i'll speak a little bit to that issue but before i begin i have to say that um, of all the indians i have met uh, or south asian people i've met intellectuals ashish Dha has always struck me personally as the most non hierarchical uh, individual i have seen and this is not just from what he writes a lot of so most South Asian intellectuals I know don't believe in hierarchy. Uh, they don't believe in hierarchical selves, but we unknowingly practice hierarchical selves uh, because you know the, the deep culture of hierarchy expresses itself on many different codes. Ashishda is somebody I've just observed with amazement. Uh, in Ashishda interacting with younger people, with older people, with people from different cultures, and there's something about him that. Um, gives me a, gives me some sense of the tremendous amount of security that he must have within himself uh, i don't know where he has the resources to get this from but i i've seen it uh, with my eyes and i've seen other intellectuals and this is something i've never forgotten uh, that i've been in the presence of a person who has grown up like all of us in a society that values hierarchy in so many different ways and who yet has managed to be non-hierarchical. So that's my personal tribute um, to this man, which has something to, uh, some relationship to what Shankar was talking about uh, as, as uh, his, his role as a, as a healer. Let me also congratulate Shail, um, uh, sincerely and personally and deeply uh, on publishing this book. I mean, this book actually um, is written in the best critical appreciative spirit, as uh, Shankar has already written. There are many articles here, Rajiv's, uh, Shail's own, uh, Partho's, uh, and others which are uh, uh, both appreciative, but also um, critical of things that Ashisha has said. But, it, it, but you know, the best criticism is always uh, made of someone you deeply respect. Uh, when when criticism is just simply dismissive and disrespectful, it is always shallow because uh, it, it, one is never one is seldom dismissive in a profound way. But what can be one can one, one can disagree in a profound way with with respect and and uh, and Ashita is also a person who has been encouraging of of this criticism. So the book captures first of all I think the very many different types of discussions. Uh, uh, on which Ashiza's thinking has had an impact. Uh, I still remember the book uh, in the 70s uh, on dominated knowledges, uh, in which uh, the Maglins uh, were major contributors and Ashiza's uh, participation in that kind of project. Uh, the Lokayan uh, magazine, uh, I think it's called the Lokayan Bulletin or whatever it was called, it was one of the early um, publications in India talking about. Uh, um, the sort of issues that Schumacher would eventually popularize, but alternative developments, ecological considerations. Um, again, I mean, going back a long time, um, Ashish does, there are pieces on cyber nationalism, um, engaging Ashish the, on, on theosophy and Madame Lavatsky and Corn Walcott. Uh, it's, it's an amazing range of collections in the book. And I think they, the book as a whole uh, does tremendous justice to what Ashishda has contributed to us. So uh, thank you, Shail, for the book and also congratulations to you and your colleagues for bringing it out. I just quickly want to say a few things about how I see Ashishda both from this book uh, and uh, generally from reading him for so many years now. Um, I think Shankar is right to say that Ashishda uh, is a healer. Uh, fundamentally, but I think it's a way of saying, saying that one of his biggest concerns, as she says, is psychological health uh, and what it takes to be psychologically healthy. And, my, and it, is as, it is as a psychologist of cultures, of histories, of uh, even uh, of the stories he tells, it seems to me that Ashish is somebody who's always thought that it's very important to find room for ambivalence, for, um, for anguish, uh, for uh, dilemmas, 
um, in a healthy psychology. So, uh, I, you know, I, long before I met Ashish, I was told a story about Ashish, and if it's true, uh, but I'll I'll tell the story that apparently Ashish and and one of the examiners of my PhD thesis, Professor Eric Hobsbawm, met in some conference where where Ashish was carrying on with his uh, criticisms of modernization technology and these things, when apparently a, a kind of agitated uh, Eric Hobsbawm stood up and said, Mr. Nandi, if your child was dying one night from cholera or some other infection, would you take that child to, the modern, to a modern hospital? And to which apparently Ashish said, I probably, I probably will, Professor Hobson, but allow me my, please allow me my anguish about the decision. So, so it's this question of uh, being split on the question of modernization, uh, having room for debates about modernization. So when um, Shail has this beautiful description of the CSDS as it was, uh, where, um, uh, people met for long lunches. They worked at home and they met for long lunches or for long evening drinks, perhaps uh, scotch, uh, as Shankar was suggesting. But where? But this was all happening in in an India that was that was actually modernizing uh, in Nehru's time, and that modernization goes back to debate central to nationalist thinking on economy, uh, uh, basically a debate between sort of Gandhian modes of uh, thinking the economy and, and polity and Nehruvian modes. And one of, the, one of the fascinating things, of course, is that these two men who were so different uh, had so much affection for each other and respect for each other. And therefore, they, they must have, I mean, even when I read Nehru on dams and, uh, I mean, he, you, you can read him on, on the Himalayas and, and talk about the rivers and their potentiality for dams. And you can always see a Nehru who is at the same time trying to suppress the romantic in him. The romantic in him, in him who, who has a totally different relationship to rivers and mountains than the modernizing there. So, and in many respects, I think that the, the modernization moment of Nehruvian India was one in which modernization carried with it and people, the modernizing leaders carried with themselves, very respectful memories of people like Gandhi who would have been opposed to the path of modernization they were following. So in some ways, uh, that anguish that Ashish the uh, apocryphally spoke of in this conference was central to the spirit of modernization. So that it was a modernization that was looking for critiques. Uh, sometimes we used to think of uh, growing up in high school, the uh, people who got displaced by a dam as so-called the, the cost of uh, development or the cost of modernization. But at least people had to think about the costs and Ashisa and people reminded them of the cost. And that's why uh, in, in some ways, if I look at the description of modernization as a whole, there was room there for this, this anguish and Ashish they embodied a lot of that in his writing. I mean, without him, I think that anguish wouldn't have been theorized. But at the same time, you have to remember that even the subtitle of the book called The Intimate Enemy is called The Loss and Recovery of Self. So the self was always the project. And I often think that what uh, the philosopher Charles Taylor tried to do for the West in Sources of the Self by looking at texts. Ashiza is reading cultures, texts, artifacts, all kinds of things to give us some sense of the sources, the conflicting, contradictory sources of the modern Indian self. But what I do want to end uh, uh, discussing is that, sorry, I said I'd uh, start my timer, I forgot to start it. Um, Ravi would indicate when I'm over my time, please. Okay. I mean, I'm getting old and I tend to. I think you're okay. You're okay. <laughs> okay. You're okay. Yeah. How, how much time do you think I have? Uh, five minutes? Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Good. So, uh, so I was going to end by saying that, but I think that moment of modernization in which Shankar is totally right to say that um, Gandhi and, and, and Savarkar are like, uh, like, like foil characters. And I would actually, I would triangulate. I would say there is Nehru, Gandhi, and Savarkar. Uh, and, and, and the Gandhi-Savarkar side being split between Gandhi and, and Savarkar, as you were saying. If that was one moment of modernization, and uh, as an aside, I might say, you know, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, uh, only the other day I was reading when, um, when Mohanlal Dhingra actually murdered uh, Willie Curzon. One of the justifications given by Shamji Krishnavarma 
of that murder was by referring back to Herbert Spencer and uh, John Stuart Mill and saying that the suicide killer or the killer who knows he loses life because this is the act of murder was actually only trying to individualize the individual in himself. That, that in other words, it was an ethical act of being an individual. Uh, and, and Gandhi's spirit of militancy is the same, an ethical act of being an individual, except that he doesn't want to kill. He's totally opposed to killing. So there's a lot of shared ground there in that modernization. But what I want to suggest today is that today we are in another mode, another moment of modernization, which is not the same as an earlier moment. I mean, this is a moment when every modernizing leader is an aspiring Xi Jinping or an aspiring or a wannabe Deng Xiaoping. Uh, one of the interesting things about the consuming classes of today is that I was looking at some who were in student statistics that in, in the year 2000, the uh, the people from, you know, the so-called developed countries, Western Europe, North America, Japan, made up the bulk of the middle class consuming classes of the world. Today, 70% of the consuming classes are from China, India, Africa, Bangladesh, and other uh, uh, non so called typically non western societies and this modernization moment has an ironical link with the moment in which ashish das critique was functioning and was inspiring us and here is here is the and and and, and i want to i want to speak a little bit about the ironical link and and, and end the ironical link has to do with the history of post truth uh, you know, we sometimes think of post-truth as having arrived with either Trump or with Facebook uh, or with the social media. But the moment of post-truth is a contradictory, the, the, the origin of the birth of post-truth moment is an extremely uh, interesting moment pregnant with contradictory tendencies. And I go back to Ashish Dada's essay, which was very inspiring, um, Forgotten History's Forgotten Doubles, which inspired many of us, Shail, I'm sure, I myself, and, and many others, which, you know, we have thought with it for a long time. But the very rise of memory studies, the search for alternatives to history, which began absolutely validly as a democratic argument, as an argument against dominating forms of knowledge, as an argument against uh, stemming from the proposition we had made in subaltern studies that history, anthropology, these were colonial forms of knowledge and were meant to dominate people. And therefore we we're looking for other forms of memory, other collocations of the past with which people resisted the state, the colonial state or the modern state. And therefore we um, supported those kind of movement, those search for memories. Uh, without being critical of the proposition, which arose from the 70s on, with people claiming, my experience is my history. And what happened was, at that very moment, we moved away from the idea that you produce a historical fact, not just, just out of your experience, but by actually interrogating your experience that is interrogating testimony with the help of several pieces of evidence. Now, that moment seemed perfectly legitimate because actually we were doing so in, uh, in the aid of the cultural self-assertion of groups that have long been denied representation of history, the indigenous groups, the Dalits, the, the, the lower caste groups, and in many ways, Badri Narayan's work on, on, on uh, the Bhajan Samaj party and their kind of production of history is, is testimony to that, uh, that moment. But what we lost, I think, in that distinction, which today is, looks like a major loss, is the distinction between uh, the claim that there is no ultimate truth and the struggle to be truthful. In other words, there may not be an ultimate truth. But I still have the responsibility to look at all possible available evidence to actually even look at evidence that uh, directly confronts my own biases and my prejudices. So that truthfulness was actually an ethical 
injunction for the historian to engage in an ethically critical relationship with his or her own prejudices and biases. And today, when I look back, it seems to me that that was one of the, so in a Foucauldian sense, one might say, you know, if you look, do a genealogy of the post-truth moment, uh, it goes back to these, these other historical moments that are so rich and pregnant with contradictory uh, possibilities. And of course, it would have been impossible for us at that situation, ourselves at that moment to foresee and anticipate what technologies like WhatsApp, what technologies like uh, um, Facebook that are so capable of generating what today we know as fake news would do to that very moment, that, that very moment's resistance to evidence, to truthfulness. And today, it seems to me that we are caught in this moment of modernization where either um, there's big data, the Cambridge Analytica moment, where economists and everybody is trying to collect huge amounts of data about human behavior in order to, in order to be able to predict either consumer behavior or voting behavior or, uh, on the one hand, or there's a complete disregard for evidence-based judgment and people taking the position anything goes so that there's complete separation in many movements today, both on the left and on the right, between what you would call a truth proposition. Like, yes, patriarchy exists as a large truth. Yes, colonialism exists as a large truth. Yes, racism exists as a large truth. And any interest in the facts of a particular case. And this divorce of truth from an interest in the facts of a particular case uh, is creating forms of undemocracy. Uh, forms of resistance to deliberative, to the deliberative aspects of, of democracies, that and 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 creating a crisis for something you would call judgment, a critical judgment, which is neither a dependence on algorithm big data, nor an anything goes position, where you basically look at evidence to in order, in order to come up with a with a with a with a judgment that is always provisional, and that for its own strength is actually dependent on somebody else being able to counter that judgment. And that's why it's the first moment of modernization in India, which Ashish the inhabited and lived his life through and commented on, precisely had that moment. The CSDS for me is that moment in which the question of the, the, that statement, but you know, Professor Hobson, please allow me my anguish, was institutionalized uh, in a center that was neither professionalized in the modern American sense nor did it follow you know, the, the virtues of war work routine and stuff, people would get together and discuss, discuss things, but they would, still, uh, they would still produce evidence. They would be evidentially proceeded. And now his own writing is full of um, evidence that he produces in support of his um, position, as are all the articles in this book. And, and, but today, I think we are going through another moment of modernization where the very idea of what Ashitza would have regarded as a healthy self, that is a self which is in conflict and is always engaged in recovering itself. That space for anguish, for ambivalence, ambiguity is being completely extinguished by a more authoritarian construction of a self that is full of dead certainties and which in the end probably will leave us only with the dead, yeah, not the certainties. Uh, so I'll stop there and maybe we should open up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dipesh, for you know, a lot of food for thought. And I, I think we have we have lot, lot, lots to think about. So uh, the floor is actually open for questions. Uh, and the way we will uh, do this is, uh, the way we'll do this is, uh, please uh, raise your hand. I'll try and put your audio on. The better way, uh, uh, probably the deliberate way, is for you to type in your question in the chat. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's very, very easy to do. Uh, and and I, will, I will read it out. And the panel, panelists will also see it. Uh, and uh, so, you know, questions are now open. So I did see some hands up. And, uh, you know, I, I did see some hands up and, uh, you know, it would be nice if, uh, yeah, you can, I'll have, so please bear with me where, yeah, I did see, um, yeah. Uh, so Asim has raised his hand up. 
and uh, I'm going to, uh, Asim, I'm going to allow you to talk. So, you know, you can, you know, so you have to. Am I? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Yes, go for, go for it, Asim. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shail. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you, uh, Dipeshta. And thank you, Ravi. And thank you, Ashishta, for making all this possible. It's... Uh, it's, as we know, a long ongoing discussion. Uh, I happened to watch uh, Ashishta's interview to Kaveri Bamzai just this evening and purely by coincidence because Ananya sent it uh, yesterday, I think. Uh, and uh, there's two very uh, useful formulations that Ashishta deploys there. The first one is the lumpen middle class. Uh, which I would like to extend to the Lumpen affluent because of where I'm living right now, which is in DLF uh, in Gurgaon at my parents ever since COVID began last year. And my next door or their next door neighbor is none other than one of the skines of the Parshnat Jain Parivar. And uh, there are six, uh, you know, fancy automobiles from sports model BMWs and Jaguars to everything outside their house for exactly three adults who live there. Every time there's too much salt in the food, he would lock up the servant in a room and beat him up. And once I called the cops on him and he bribed the cops away. So there is a lumpen affluent element, which is increasingly more vocal and aggressively articulate around metropolitan India. Uh, the second useful formulation that Ashista makes in that uh, interview is when he refers to the East Asian tigers as they're called by our uh, sexy economists. Uh, the East Asian tigers he refers to as man eaters. And he repeats the old uh, insight uh, of so many writers of the inevitable authoritarianism that is hardwired into developmental modernity. Uh, that it's always a matter of when the authoritarianism shows its face explicitly and when it goes into hiding for some time and pretends to be liberal and democratic and so on. My question, and this could be addressed by any of you really, because I'm sure all of you have given thought to this. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, Dipeshna mentioned the, uh, the, the present moment of modernization as a unique one where 70% of the consumers are from these and not those parts of the world. Uh, where do you see, or how do you see the denouement of this? Uh, I'm not asking you to be a prophet. I'm only expecting you to be a historian here and uh, dwell, uh, reflect a little bit on the dialectics of time to use Brodel's uh, lovely uh, phrase, which is going to take us there. Thank you, Asim. You can mute yourself now. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dibesh, you want to take this on? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I can have a go at it and then others can, of course, go in. No, Asim. Thank you very much for uh, those questions. I mean, the the problem, of course, is um, I mean, I agree with the spirit of uh, the description lumpen middle class, but I probably wouldn't use the word lumpen, and that's for a simple practical reasons. You know, there was a legal activist, a very respected legal activist in uh, what used to be Andhra Pradesh, I think, uh, Kannabiran, and once I was talking to him, and he said he was once in court. <laughs> defending a well-known criminal and uh, and the judge said to him, Mr. Kandabiran, why are you defending this guy? You know that he has a very bad record and Kandabiran then said, your honor, who knows I might be defending a future chief minister of the state. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so who knows who, who what is describing as Lumpen. But look, the point I want to, uh, want to make a larger point is that uh, and this is a point that people, it comes out of my recent hobby horse, you know, I've been working on climate change and, and uh, the question of planetary changes. And one of the things that's happened, if you look at the statistics, you know, it took humanity, hum homo sapiens, 3,000, 300,000 years to get to the figure 1 billion. And that was 1900. And at the end of that century, in 2000, we were over 6 billion. 
and now going on to be nine. But if you look at this period, this is when consumption goes up, everything goes up. And, and, the, and the problem of global warming also happens. But one of the things that, that uh, is remarkable about this period is that humans also became the biggest earth moving agency on the planet. So we now move more just earth around than uh, all the rivers of the world do, taken together. And this is something we don't, it, it is actually part of everyday life. We don't think about it. So one day I was totally shocked by newspaper reports, uh, reading in Bangla, living overseas, and Anand Bajar said, um, um, 31 hills have gone missing in Rajasthan. So I said, how do hills go missing? Uh, so then I realized reading the report that the hills still show up on topographical maps. But they've been completely illegally raised to the ground, being quarried for uh, uh, for stones and to actually supply the construction boom, not just in India, but also in Bangladesh. Because everybody who now builds a new flat wants a granite you know, kitchen bench or a white marble kitchen bench or whatever. But that indicative, I mean, there's a, there's a crisis of sand throughout the world. And I don't know about other parts of India, but uh, in, in West Bengal, uh, there's a word we use called Bali Khadan, you know, the illegal mining of sand and particularly mining of riverbeds for sand. And it comes up in newspapers as very poignant story. So there was a story saying that three young men had gone to uh, run for a swim in a river they knew was shallow with a lot of sand banks in it. What they didn't know is that the river had been illegally dredged and it, the currents had changed and one of the boys died. So what comes up in a newspaper as a point and story about somebody's accidental death is actually indicative of what's going on. It's really indicative of the underside of this tremendous spurt in consumption. And the underside is tremendous ecological devastation. And that's happening in India, that's happening in Brazil, that's happening everywhere. I mean, I could go on giving facts about it. Uh, so I, I actually do see this, uh, this current point of modernization the headlong rush into it, and the intolerance about any moments of anguish, uh, ambivalence, uh, discussion of it. Uh, I, I do see it as, as uh, producing, if not a huge catastrophe, at least a series of minor catastrophes, uh, including the current pandemic being one of them, because of, because of the in, infection disease specialist like and Fauci, who is the who is the head in America, have been saying that we have entered an era of pandemics, where the frequency of pandemics will increase for the simple reason that we are cutting down too many forests and forcing wildlife to come close to humans. So there is a huge big drama going on in the history of biological life on this planet. Uh, and that question of the crisis of life in general was not a question that was present in front of Ashish and people when they were discussing modernization in the 1970s. We were, we, this question wasn't there. We were talking about improving individual lives of humans. We we're talking about justice between humans. Now there's a huge, big, very question of life itself is under discussion in this current moment. And, and this moment of modernization is tied to what I see as a crisis in the general order of life and biodiversity as such. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's an early article by K. Balagopal where he talked about the late K. Ba the Lumpen bourgeoisie. I think uh, an old article in EPA. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, and Andy Gunda Frank used the category yeah, yeah, exactly. Lumpen bourgeoisie. Lumpen so, I mean, it, it, has, it is a respectable, but, but the Lumpens are now, yeah. they're the rulers. So, you know, they're so, more powerful than you. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions for Shell. I think this, this really pertains to Shell, something that's there in your introduction and something for Sh what Shankar said. And I'm going to read them out. And, and uh, you know, first is by uh, Rajakopal and Radhakrishnan. And it's a very general question. It says, uh, when is healing timely and when is it premature? And the second one, I think actually it's, it's, it's quite pertinent. He says, uh, the, the attendee who's anonymous says, Nandi has traditionally termed communal violence as an expression of the pathological response to the violence of modernity at the hands of the modern state, a kind of invasion of the secular self into the religious self. Would anyone uh, hear ever that the current unbating, unabating authoritarianism in India is also gendered by democratic interventions in the traditional self? So I think, Shell, you want to take that on? And then Shankar, do uh, you think it, you know, Yeah. 
You have to unmute yourself, Cheryl. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, thank you uh, for that. I, I think Shankar will take on the, the first question about healing. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if I really got the point that you're trying to make about, uh, you know, so, sort of Ashista, you know, insisting that it's the secular self, you know, which you know, inflicts violence on the religious self. No? Is it, yeah, right. That's the, that's the, ter the, the terms that I've, so um, I think I'll go along with, uh, uh, you know, um, the point uh, Dipesh was making about ambivalence. I mean, can you really demarcate the religious and the secular in, in, in you know, in an act of violence? You know, a lot, a, a good deal of, expressed religiosity is actually grounded in secularization. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, Savarkar being a, you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a prime example of, uh, and uh, Dipesh mentioned also the, the, the Madanlal uh, Dhingra moment, you know, 1909, you know, Ga Gandhi's own, um, encounter with uh, with with Savarkar and, uh, and 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 then the assassination uh, and I find it hard to really see I mean I think you can talk about the ethical and um, and, and, and 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 the and the and the instrumentalists and you can see clearly that what what Madanlal Jhingra has internalized is this idea that you know violence is necessary uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, get rid of the British Empire, and uh, that therefore um, you must resort to assassination. And for Gandhi, it's it's you know violence is is not justified uh, you know uh, on those grounds at all. And you know the, the the debate that they have on on the occasion of the Shera actually foregrounds, and and the ways in which they. Um, uh, there's this reading of the of the figure of of Ram, yeah. And uh, uh, for 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 Gandhi, Ram is this you know uh, this this ethical figure, where for uh, Savarkar he's really you know this uh, this warrior who will you know um, kill Ravan, you know bring the Babri Mosque down, yeah. This is the symbol of. Hindu humiliation, as it were. So that's the kind of so. So I'm not sure whether I I would agree with, uh, you know, the point that Ashishta. I mean, looking at it from his point of view, that he makes this kind of distinction uh, yeah, between the religious and the secular. This absolute distinction, despite his critique of 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 the secular. Uh, before I go to uh, Shankar, you know, Shell, just to just to add to that, I wonder sometimes, and I've had this chat with uh, you know Ashish when he was writing, you know, doing the partition stuff. Sometimes violence has a kind of productive performativity which can't be partitioned in this secular uh, religious debate, you know, and this this we see increasingly. It 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 take it takes on a kind of cycle once it expands. And I really think we need to revisit these categories Absolutely. and work through them. Just as you know Dipesh said we are in this new moment. We really need to open this up. And uh, so that that always troubles me a bit, you know, uh, whether we should impute some of these clear, uh, you know, strategies to violence. Shankar, sorry, sorry to keep you waiting. Please go ahead on the healing part. Well, it's it's always difficult to try to uh, speak on behalf of, much less defend the thoughts of Ajit Mandi. But let me just say that uh, I don't think that for Ashish Nadi, uh, it can ever be too uh, early or too late for healing. I think the question that might be more appropriate to ask is how does the healing occur? Is it healing that 
is building on the own strengths of the patient or of the community or of the society, the, by which I think he, he means things like the own capacities of the ailing patient to auto-critique and auto-reform uh, oneself. Um, and what are the processes for which that can happen? I think that is, uh, as opposed to a quote unquote healing process that is imposed, which, uh, which may appear to yield uh, good results, but which may be introducing other kinds of poisons into the patient. Uh, let me also uh, just say about the second question, that as far as I've understood um, Ashish Mandi, I'm not sure that he has ever denied that there has been uh, communal violence in pre-modern India. Uh, communities have fought, uh, they have killed each other. It reminds one of um, Gandhi in Hinswaraj talking about Hindus and Muslims and saying, like brothers, sometimes we will fight and we will break each other's heads, he says that. But we will also perhaps find ways to come back together, resolve our differences you know, without the help of lawyers and courts and so forth. So I think the distinction that he makes is that in modern times, it seems that communal violence has taken on an annihilatory uh, uh, dimension the desire to do away with the other. Uh, and that is uh, something that is a different phenomenon to be, uh, to, to, uh, to be down to us. So um, I wanted to just make that statement. Okay. So we ha still have sp time for questions and uh, I'm looking uh, for so Shell has asked me if Abner Fark. Shell, you asked for Abner Fark, and he is. I don't see him in the list yet. Uh, I, you know, he. I don't see him in the list. We did get a message from him, but I, I had actually a question for Dipeshda on this point you raised, and this goes back to some of, the, some of what Ash, Ashish has talked about. So, if we have to rework the categories of authentic experience, uh, if you have to, you know address it and I, I, I wonder if you're asking for a return to some form of a more modest realism, not the old style realism, a different address of realism. And connected to this, what if testimony, and, and Shell has also dealt with this in, in her introduction, what if testimony is, is not uniquely human? If we expand the sphere of testimony, uh, from uh, to address other life forms on this planet, we, we you know te testimony, witnessing, speech, the whole cognitive deliberative faculty that was so uniquely central to you know humanity. So if we are moving into this new moment, maybe we need to rework these categories. Yeah, I, th I think we need to rework these categories. We need to rework even the category of the political uh, in in that sense. So first of all, let me just tell you. Uh, begin from the proposition that hasn't quite happened yet. And for me, uh, you know, just to give you an example, there's a book by uh, the American political scientist called Steve Vanderheiden. And it's a book, uh, the title of the book is, uh, it's about atmospheric justice. And the very first chapter actually acknowledges that whatever humans do to the atmosphere also affects non-humans who use the atmosphere for either uh, photosynthetic purposes, or for breathing. Uh, so other animals with lungs and things, they, uh, they breathe, uh, even the fish breathe. And therefore he argues in the first chapter that any proper exploration of atmospheric, atmospheric justice will have to take into account the non-human. And then he acknowledges that in political science, there's no algorithm for actually looking at justice between humans and non-humans with regard to the atmosphere. So then it's he says, look, so I'll only, uh, but he's a Rawlsian. So he says, I can only use the Rawlsian algorithm if I treat nations as persons. 
And then it's a standard argument about climate justice, uh, you know, who, who does what, et cetera. But uh, what I find fascinating about the book is the acknowledgement right up front that as a political scientist in his disciplines, he doesn't find a moment for, for uh, actually expanding the framework, but he acknowledges like you, as you do in your question, that we, we need to work on, on, on expanding this framework. Uh, uh, going back to the question of experience and, and testimony. So see, when I was working on Jadunath Sarkar book, uh, on which I have once had this wonderful opportunity to lecture the, at the center, what I was struck by somebody like Jadunath, and it, it made me go back and, uh, and think about truth a great deal, truth and fact, is that, you know, when he was working on how many days it took Shivaji to escape from Aurangzeb's prison in Agra and get to Banaras in disguise. And then I realized that in different editions of his book on Shivaji, he was changing the number of days. It made no difference to the narrative. Because the number of days differed only by a few days. And then I kept wondering why is this man doing it? Because he had, he had made to himself a pledge that he was going to constantly be as factual as possible. And, and fact was not something that was given to you in the raw material. Fact was what he would construct as a historian by looking at different pieces of evidence. And then I realized that, that this is what interrogating testimony is. So when I say that my experience is my testimony or is my history, I'm actually skipping a step. I'm not saying this is a testimony to be interrogated. And what happens in that, in that moment is that the distinction between uh, an experience that you might regard as authentic and the distinction and the experience you might not regard as, you know, as, as authentic goes because then there's no way of actually judging between experiences. And, and that opens the door then to eventually with technology and everything to what we today know as, as, as fake news. So to go back to your question, Ravi, uh, it, it's time to, that's why, you know, Bernard Williams, the philosopher has a very interesting book on truthfulness. And I'm making a distinction between truth and truthfulness. Because truthfulness is, uh, an ethic of responsibility we owe to ourselves as investigators. It doesn't assume that we can arrive at the truth. But today it is this precisely this responsibility that is given up by many movements, both on the left and on the right, movements that are actually fighting for progressive causes and movements that are fighting for causes we would, you and I would agree was reactionary. But uh, there are a lot of these movements that have given up on this question of the exercise of truthfulness uh, and who therefore say that the large truth on which the movement is based itself enough for judging every particular case on which we're not going to look at the facts. And, and that I think is a huge problem for, of our times. Thank you. I don't know if this answers yeah. all of your questions. Yeah, I think yeah. I've at oh, least answered two. So, there's a question by Pratima uh, for you, Dipeshta, but I think I have a question for Shell. You know, one of your chapters, Shell, very interesting because I was in a discussion recently that uh, referred to this part, part of your work and, it's, and, and uh, it was so well formulated. I want to share this with others. This is your unique take on the pastoralist uh intervention in 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 the larger map of the political you know this hostility to uh, you know mobile mobile un, you know the mobile populations this 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 relationship with the animal you know what, what is you know referred to as the animal world so can you can you share us a little bit uh, you know with with, with with people who are watching this a really interesting take you, you have on 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 the status of the past release. Yeah, uh, yeah, Ravi, uh, I, I think you brought up uh, uh, this other very interesting thing also with respect to the patients uh, on the non-anthropocentric modes of testimony. And I think that, you know, in, in connection with the ground that Shankar had laid and uh, Dipesh's own work on climate change, I think that's something to be just very, very important uh, in the kind of experience testimony. Uh, now, in terms of uh, pastoralism and uh, 
you know, I think there's, first of all, what, in, in terms of um, a, life, a life form and also in terms of the academy, I see, you know, the, the, the pastoral as really having a, a, a truly marginal status. The peasant is marginal, you know, but uh, nonetheless, as, uh, uh, as Ashish Nandi reminded me once, the peasant is, is still uh, very majorly on our horizon, you know. It's on our horizon, not just because of the Kisan movement, but also because, you know, the, uh, uh, as he would say, uh, the Indian pe uh, pe peasantry, the Russian and the Chinese, these constitute the great peasant populations of, of the world. But the past, but the pastoral really uh, is a political economy, uh, a, a life form, which is so. There's this emphasis on uh, 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 the industrial uh, 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 political economy, the agrarian. Uh, but there are two others which get left out. One is the artisanal, and the other is 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 the pastoral. And I think even as uh, you know, we look at uh, you know, the founding moment of, of the nation state. And uh, one of the things, um, you know, in an essay on the Gujars, uh, I looked at is, you know, Nehru's address, you know, to the, to the Gujar Bakarwal of, of Jammu, and, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, telling them to settle down, you know. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, look at what's, you know, what uh, Israel and so many other states are doing to the Bedouin. You know? And uh, so, uh, so that's among several other things that I have to say about, about the past room. Okay, I have a question from uh, Pratama and uh, let me just, yeah. And, uh, and then Rajshi has raised her hand, but I'll just read out Pratama's uh, question first, uh, sorry, yeah. Prathama says, uh, I want, uh, and this is Prathama Banerjee, my colleague, I want Deepesh Dar to say more on the two different moments of critique of science and development and the changing critical purchase that ancient indigenous discourses have acquired today in the Anthropocene scholarship, or to put it differently, the change connotation of the concept of tradition uh, between then and now. Uh, so Deepesh Dar, you want to? Uh, sure, yes, yeah. okay. Thanks, Prathama. It's a, you know, a good complicated question and I have to say you know uh, I'll, I'll answer it but uh, before I answer it uh, I think of my own answer as uh, you know little pamphlets we used to buy uh, from the from pavement booksellers when I was young little pamphlets which used to have uh, the words of the songs of particular films that we liked we used to buy the lyrics and it would include a, a little synopsis of the story of the film and, but it would never finish the story. And it would, they sort of put ellipses, you know, dots and then said, now go and watch on the big screen. So my, the, my ellipses basically say, please read my book, but I'll give you the short answer as I, as I can. So, um, and, and it connects the two, two questions. So today we are, I think at a very peculiar moment uh, on the question of the relationship between the planetary crisis, environmental crisis that we face, and our capacity to experience the crisis. Whereas in an earlier moment, think of Hippie Thompson's book on the English working class. It was assumed in that book that the changes wrought by capitalism were experienceable by the working class. And that's why experience was such a big category in Hippie Thompson's notion of subaltern history that how people experience the world was actually part of what your meta narrative about the world was that it was experienced. But the climate crisis is it first of all it sets up what Timothy Morton calls the hyper object, which is only uh, a, a product of you know statistics, climate modeling, satellite observations. You set up an entity called planetary climate system, which you don't bang into. You don't experience it. What you experience locally is your weather. You experience Delhi getting hotter. You experience the pollution, the, 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 the particulate pollution. You don't necessarily experience carbon dioxide as a, as a pollution. It's such a, it's a trace element in the atmosphere. So there's a, there's a peculiar, and, and this is where a lot of the critique, today's politics against science, critique of science exists, is that many people want to say, look, 
we have to bring it down to people's experience if people have to do something. And, and the critical point is that when you construct a planetary climate system and you look at what regulates the climate of the planet as a whole, you realize that a lot of the factors that you see as regulatory factors are simply not experienceable by human beings because humans don't live there. So what is the role of the deep sea in maintaining the, the temperature of the planet? I mean, it has a role, but we can't experience it because we don't live there. The, the, the Siberian permafrost, we don't live there. The, the, uh, the Himalayan glaciers, we are the beneficiaries of the glaciers, but we don't experience the glaciers. So, so the climate system is a system that is in, you know, in old Clifford Gears terms, an, experience, an extremely experienced distant category. So people who think that the politics of climate change can be completely anthropo, uh, can be completely say, humanized, can be, can, can be made completely uh, accessible to human experience or capacity experience are misguiding themselves because, uh, because the planetary climate system is something that is beyond human experience, not just the system itself, but even the factors that, that people argue regulate the climate. So therefore, experience is a very different category today to, as, as it, uh, from what it would have been in E.P. Thompson's text. And that, uh, therefore, goes to the other two questions you raised raise about traditional modernity and the indigenous discourses. So some people uh, who, again, wants to completely humanize the problem, then say, okay, in the indigenous discourses, we have an answer to the nature culture separation. In the indigenous discourses, there is an answer to the nature culture separation. But even the indigenous people don't know what, what goes on in the deep seas. Actually, for the indigenous people, most of the sea traditionally used to be coastal. Uh, and the other, other big question that people raise is that, can you scale up the indigenous modes of living to actually feed 10 billion, 12 billion people? But that's a separate question, I'll bracket it. And, and I think, and that again, can connect up with the traditional modernity question. Our entire debate about modernization, modernity, modernism um, in the 70s, 80s, even the early 90s was really a debate between humans about humans uh, and about the future of humans, about justice between humans. This current moment of modernization has exposed us to something that, you know, in my book, I call the planet, uh, which I, I argue is absolutely, uh, uh, we are dependent on the planet for our existence, but the planet doesn't look back at us. It, it's not, so, it, so philosophically, I might say that in the previous, mode of, in the previous moment of debating modernity and modernization, we assumed that there was a givenness of the world. The world itself was given to us. And with, it's within the givenness of the world that the debates unfolded. Now, the very question of the givenness of the world has emerged as a big open question. Is the world necessarily given to us? Now that I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Some of it may sound mystical and not self explanatory As I said, my ellipsis, please read the book. But if there are further questions, follow up questions on this, I'd be happy to uh, also uh, elaborate more. Thank Thanks. you. And and Cher tells me that Frederick Maglin's piece in the in the book uh, is a, is a basically addresses you know Prathama's question. Now, yeah. So and actually, I, it's also the book where Latour makes an entrance. Yeah. In in it's, it's that essay where Latour makes an entrance in the book. Yeah. So Rachi, I'm going to allow you to talk. You can, uh, you know, speak, speak now, put your audio on and speak. Uh, yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks, Ravi. I was actually logged into Facebook and then I tried because I wanted to ask something. I tried to log into Zoom and maybe I misheard or maybe I didn't uh, quite hear what Shell had to say on Savarkar and Nehru. But before I come to Savarkar and Nehru, I want to comment on Professor Deepesh uh, Chakravarti's absolutely insightful comment on the, uh, on the idea of, uh, on two things actually. One, on the fact that we, uh, we are in a post-truth moment. Actually, your voice is breaking up. I mean, a, a moment and where we, we where we do uh, try and unearth or discern fact from unfact, fact from untruth, etc. And the other point that you made uh, 
about um, uh, it's slipping my mind right now, but let me come back to uh, Savarkar and Nehru. I just want to, I don't think I have a question uh, for Shell as much as I want to narrate a particular incident from my classroom. I teach in Delhi University and I teach a paper called Indian Political Thought. And I just finished uh, teaching uh, Savarkar. And during the course of my teaching, and this is a comment on Savarkar and Nehru's processes of secularization. And during the course of my teaching Savarkar, there's a very articulate and one of the most vocal students of mine that I've ever come across in my two decades of teaching. Uh, and she's a Muslim. And she began asking me something and she broke down in class. And I don't think in uh, my two decades of two and a half decades of teaching, I have ever come across a moment where a student loses her personal calm over something that happened nearly a hundred years ago and over something that was spoken nearly, nearly a hundred years ago. And uh, in the syllabus, Savarkar is, uh, uh, you know, uh, after Savarkar comes Iqbal. But this, this moment of this girl breaking down stayed with me and it actually really upset me because in some senses, it was my failing as a teacher to give her the confidence to interrogate and apprehend Savarkar. But I let that be and I decided to do Nehru. And uh, Nehru is not half as interesting as, as Iqbal in many senses. His, his, his idea of secularism has been decoded and done, uh, uh, you know, over and over again. And there is nothing, uh, there's nothing philosophically or spiritually um, either conflicted or complex about the idea. But I decided to do uh, Nehru as a bomb to, you know, to uh, specially addressing in my head, to the students' conflict. And um, I don't think I've ever taught Nehru with as much um, passion and as much uh, uh, personal investment as this time. And it was absolutely wonderful to, to be able to uh, speak of Nehru in Nehru's own voice. So the point, you know, to cut the long story short, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, we use broad brush strokes of modernity and secularization. And it's like Adipeshda talked about, uh, you know, uh, truth being divorced from fact. Uh, we also need to understand that the idea of modernity itself needs to be complicated, where we do not just talk about modernity's adherence to fact or truth, but the idea of, of, the, of morality, the idea of what this idea of secularization was trying to bring about. In Nehru's case, it was trying to bring about a united India. In, in Savarkar's case, it was a divisive agenda. So somewhere in the idea of modernity, this needs to be brought brought in. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Rachi. You can mute yourself now. And and thank you for that you know story. It's very difficult being a teacher in these really difficult times, and particularly this, this incident that you talked about. I can't even imagine what that would be like. You know, teachers obviously are facing this at an everyday level when they're dealing with these thinkers, which are more accurate. Shell, you want to, want to say something? I mean, this is, you know, I, I think it is more of a comment, but but if you want to say something, I, you know, Shankar, if you want to say something, uh, you know. No, I I, I want to say, um, Rajshri, uh, thank, uh, thank you for that. And if you look at the protests against the Constitution Amendment Bill, you know, I mean, you, well, one, one understands perfectly it's the same reason why you know that those protests were so strong and and so vehement and it's really the Savarkarite imagination you know of Punyabhumi that India is the land only of those whose pilgrimage sites are in the subcontinent excluding Christians and Muslims whose, you know, uh, whose pilgrimage sites might be in, in Rome or, or Jerusalem or, or, or Mecca. Uh, so, uh, so, I mean, and, and this is, has to do with, you know, it, it has to do with belonging. It has to do with identity. It has to do with citizenship. It has to do with, you know, all kinds of rights. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a diabolical uh, imagination, but it's something which we're living with uh, 
you know, and is being, in, you know, increasingly making inroads into our state, uh, our sovereignty, our developmental imagination. I mean, uh, Ashista's pathologies of modernity are being, you know, sort of writ larger and larger, uh, even as, as, uh, as you know, uh, uh, you know, as we're seeing this unfolding before, before our eyes. But on Nehru, I was saying something quite different. Uh, Nehru does have an, you know, have a, have a, have a understanding of history. I mean, uh, uh, Sham Benegal made, made, made Bharat a coach, which is, you know, quite, it, it's quite, a, and I've been seeing some of these episodes recently. So it's quite interesting in terms of his historical imagination. But what my, the point I was making about Nehru is that how the developmental imagination and you know the whole uh, apparatus of state and nation building is so oriented to sedentarization. You know that was the point I was making regarding Nehru. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Shell, and thank you for that comment. And Shankar, you wanted to say something about this? <laughs> so, uh... Just something very brief, which I believe Dipeshta has already said, but that. Uh, one of the interesting observations in the uh, early piece by Ashish, the final encounter, and I think that has uh, stayed in his uh, thought from that point, is the idea that um, there were actually many common views and visions between Savarkar and Nehru that contribute to the marginalization of Gandhi, uh, the assassination of Gandhi. I just wanted to say that, thank you. Thank you, I'm gonna see if there are any more questions. Yeah, I think I, if anyone has any more questions, we have uh, room for the last one before we say goodbye to everyone. Uh, we've been here, uh, you know, almost two hours. So it's, it's just the right time to, to leave. Uh, and yeah, Pratima says she found, yeah, okay. Now this is, <laughs> this is for the panelists. Anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, I want to first thank all of you, uh, for, for, for your thoughts and, and participating in this panel and, and different time zones. I want to thank all the listeners, uh, for their, uh, for their, uh, for their, you know, interventions. I know people are again in different time zones. I want to thank Shell for putting together this incredible book. Dipeshda, Shankar, thank you very much. And uh, once again, a recording of uh, this uh, video will be up on YouTube at some point. So if you've missed anything, you can catch it there. You can forward it to your friends. So thank you all. And have a good, good morning, lunch, uh, night, whatever, you know, but goodbye. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Shail. Bye. See you, Shankar. Right. See you. Bye. Bye.